So good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are around the world. You are more than welcome to today's Grant Thornton International Tax Webinar. I hope you're all keeping well. Delighted to be joined on this webinar by my GT Ireland colleague, Sasha Kearns, David Seitz from GTUS, and Matt Stringer from GT UK. Uh, we've all actually participated in a number of international tax webinars recently. And while, as you're aware, there are a number of global initiatives to reform the, the tax landscape, each country still does its own thing, and we all have our own set of rules. So we found that getting different countries' perspectives on the same webinar works really well. So hopefully today's webinar continues in that vein. The format for today is a series of very short presentations from Sasha, Matt, and David, about five minutes each, really just to, to set the scene, if you like. We're then going to move straight away to a panel discussion on the hot topics. We, we have had to put everybody on mute with cameras off, usual for webinars, but we will be delighted to take your questions. So as many, of, and we will deal with as many of those questions as possible. So please feel free to use the, the Q&A function. See that at the bottom of the screen. The questions will only be, be visible by the panelists. Please don't use the chat function. So just use the Q&A function for any questions. As I say, we'll get to as many as we can. Okay, so without further ado, I'm gonna pass over to Sasha Kearns to kick off proceedings. Thanks, Peter, and hello to everybody joining us from around the globe today. Um, if I could just move on to my first slide there. I'm going to just give a perspective um, in relation to some of the issues that businesses located in Ireland are dealing with in today's ever-changing world. Firstly, just to confirm in relation to COVID measures that were introduced, both funding support measures and also measures around tax administration burdens, these have been extended by the Irish government until the 30th of June 2021, which is beneficial for businesses. But in relation to COVID-19, we've seen huge changes as how in, in how our business operates, particularly in relation to the level of employees that have been displaced working with multinational organisations and currently working uh, in locations that may not be aligned to where they're currently contracted for. And it's interesting maybe just to platform this from the view the Irish revenue has taken across three key headings. Firstly, in relation to corporate residency, they have confirmed that to the extent a foreign employee is operating in Ireland, it won't create a permanent establishment or corporate residency position. However, in regard to employers' obligations from a payroll perspective, there were temporary relieving measures, but these have ceased from the 31st of December 2020. So effectively, from the 1st of January 2021, to the extent you have foreign employees operating in Ireland, employers may have a payroll obligation in relation to those employees. And finally, just looking at it from an individual residency perspective, Ireland operates on a day's test in relation to individual's residency. There have been some relieving measures, but these have ceased from the 18th of May 2020. So to the extent any individual is present in Ireland post the 18th of May 2020, those days will be counted for their individual perspective. Now, while there have been submissions to the Irish Revenue to encourage more consistency and to ensure that the Irish interpretation is aligned with OECD guidance that was published in January, this is the current position. And it's very important, I think, that businesses give these areas considerations now and over the coming year. Transfer pricing is a key focus for, in Ireland, for us in Ireland at the moment, because effectively from 1 January 2020, our transfer pricing legislation has been modernized and extended to bring it in line with the OECD 2017 principles. We're also seeing a huge impact on internal and external influences in ensuring that arm's length rates are set between inter-party transactions. COVID aside, we're seeing global tax reform having an impact. We're seeing um, financing structures in relation to current lending rates, negative deposit interest rates, and therefore conversations around transfer pricing with our clients is something that's a key focus for us in Ireland over the coming 12 months. DAC 6 reporting, which is in relation to mandatory disclosure of certain cross-border transactions between EU countries or between EU and a third country, is effectively live. And there's now a very short time frame of 30 days in which these transactions have to be reported. Across our Grand Thornton European network, we're seeing a huge divergence of opinion in relation to the nature of transactions that are reportable under these hallmarks. And we're also seeing pushback from a number of tax authorities in relation to the quality of transactions that have been reported under DAC 6. I think while the primary obligation for reporting doesn't necessarily sit with businesses, it sits with your advisors, there is a key focus for a number of our clients in this area to ensure that DAC 6 has been brought within your procedures and policies. 
and we're having lots of conversations in the space. We've also seen already some queries around DAC6 in relation to multi-jurisdictional due diligences. So moving on, um, where is Ireland sit from an ATAD1 and an ATAD2 perspective? We've implemented three of the five measures. We're currently in the process. We've just um, finished a consultation process in relation to the introduction of interest limitation rules. And there will be legislation coming into effect from 1 January 2022 in relation to re reverse hybrid mismatches. And then looking at digital tax, the conversation around pillar one and pillar two has been taking place at an OECD level since 2015. But the OECD has confirmed that from the 9th of July of this year, they should have a position in relation to pillar one and pillar two. Looking at where the EU are at, the EU had stepped back and, and let the, the OECD progress discussions. But as recently as last week, they have confirmed that they will be publishing um, some detail around an EU levy, levy from June of this year. So this area is a key focus for all of us, I think, for 2021. I hope that's given you a summary of some of the key areas from an Irish tax perspective. And I'm now delighted to hand you over to my UK colleague, Matt Stringer. Thank you, Sasha. Yes, so um, I'm just going to spend a few minutes um, talking about some, some UK developments. Um, the first one of which clearly is it was the budget held in the UK just a couple of weeks back on the 3rd of March, which had um, some interesting measures for the future of, of corporate tax in the UK. Um, and many of these measures will form part of a finance bill, which will become a finance act through, throughout the summer. Um, so probably the big headline that you will have seen is, is quite a hike in the corp tax rate in the UK, but signposted now for a few years in the future. So we're currently at a 19 rate and that's going to go up to 25% from the 1st of April 2023. So still two years out and, until that one takes place. Um, and, and with a small profits rate that is going to stay at 19 and some tapering so that 25% is the main rate. Um, the other big news was around allowances for investment in plant and machinery through a, a super deduction. So, so at the moment, the capital allowance regime in the UK allows for, for writing down allowances on plant and machinery spend at, at rates of 18% and 6%. And for just a two year period, so from April this year for 24 months, those allowances can now be supercharged to 130% deduction instead of the 18 and a 50% deduction instead of the six for, for qualifying new purchases of partner machinery. So, so that's a huge change and it represents not, not only full expensing uh, of plant and machinery spend for many assets, but that extra 30% over and above what's actually been spent. So it's so a big news there. And, and what it means is that the effective corporate tax rate for investment choices is actually much lower now for a two year period. And then with the ending of the super deductions and the rate hike, there's then a step change in April 2023. Um, so just some other things from the budget were um, another loss carry back amendment. So just for, for two, two years, um, for accounting periods ending between April 20 and March 22. So for, for your two accounting periods in that period, instead of just carrying losses back one year, you get some flexibility to carry losses back for three years. So that's a, a COVID measure to, to ensure that the cash taxes um, and, and losses made during COVID years could, can really result in some cash back. And then uh, a Brexit related point that I'll come on to discuss is a repeal of the interest and royalties directive for UK outbound payments that might carry a withholding tax charge. And this is a step change from the UK government that, that had previously said they were going to stick with these rules in UK law. And then various other consultations, amendments, if you're familiar with the anti-hybrid provisions, there's been some changes to those rules and some new consultations on, on administrative matters. But just speeding away from the budget then for a final couple of minutes before I hand over to David is outside of the budget, what, what's changing? So the big discussion topic that, that is clearly relevant is Brexit and, and what that means for the corporate tax and international tax landscape in the UK. And, and a few things have happened. We just talked about the repeal of the interest and royalties directive, which is very relevant. Um, the UK has also stepped back from the DAC6 provisions in almost all cases where, where the rest of the EU has implemented these rules. Um, and Brexit clearly means that the businesses are making decisions around what, what business they put where, and, and that has a, a transfer pricing and, and a direct tax impact. 
digital taxes. Sasha already mentioned the OECD and the EU's view of the world here. Um, the UK already has a digital services tax, so a, a gross revenue tax at 2% on certain revenue streams. So quite a specific targeted tax on very large groups in very specific industries. Um, but there is a commitment there from the UK to take this away um, once there is consensus at OECD level on the pillar one and two proposals. And then finally, in relation to coronavirus, Sasha mentioned the, the PE and residence risks around remote workers. Um, HMRC um, have their own guidance around PE risk especially, um, and in terms of what saying that the UK's rules are already quite fit for purpose here around what is permanent. Um, but there's certainly a focus on this area. And as we move away from um, lack of travel and genuine health concern as the reasons for remote working and more into a world of employers wanting to be more flexible and employee choice as to where they work, this issue becomes more and more relevant. And I'm sure we'll, we'll get on to discussing that as a group shortly. And that's all from me, David. Thanks, Matt. Peter, Sasha, greetings from the US and greetings to all of our participants. It's uh, wonderful to be here today. So let's jump right in. Um, I would say the situation is fluid in the United States right now. Um, obviously, President Biden was sworn in on January 20th and brought with him an ambitious legislative agenda, um, many of it rooted in uh, progressive tax reform, which um, has been a, a centerpiece of his agenda um, from the campaign all the way through the early days of his presidency. To date, um, we've seen a very large focus on COVID stimulus with our most recent legislative package coming in the form of a $1.9 trillion targeted relief package that included $1,400 checks, uh, for individuals in families making less than $150,000, um, relief for certain unemployment income, and modest, modest um, business uh, tax changes. However, the real focus um, really as of this week in Washington, D.C., is where the Democrats turn next um, with respect to legislation and where President Biden's agenda takes us next. The Wall Street Journal and Washington Post recently reported that the Biden administration is planning to come out with a significant infrastructure and climate bill. And so we're talking about roads, bridges, uh, tunnels, perhaps some help with canals maybe, um, and, and, and significant climate reform, um, uh, uh, significant uh, incentives for people to invest in battery, clean energy, things like that. The three to $4 trillion price tag that the Democrats have, have put on that necessitates some modifications to the tax system. And so uh, we expect that we'll see some tax increases aimed at businesses with that bill. Um, and it's important that, that um, uh, folks keep an eye out for that. So if we turn to the next slide, it's important to, to remember it, what the, the, the state of the state is, is for the Democrats as they try to move legislation. Remember, they have a very narrow majority in the United States Senate, uh, meaning that um, the bills that they propose are gonna have to kind of thread the needle between the conservative Democrats and maybe the more progressive Democrats in order to maintain every vote in the majority. Um, they'll have to um, put forward uh, things that almost have bipartisan support. There is a, a, a process called reconciliation. This reconciliation process allows legislation to move through the United States Senate with only a very slim majority. Most legislation requires a 60 vote uh, majority. Currently, the Democrats hold 50 votes. Um, so reconciliation allows them to move legislation. Reconciliation is tricky politically. It's limited in the amount of times it can be used. But I would point out that reconciliation was the vehicle that carried the Trump tax reforms in 2017. It was also the vehicle that carried the most recent stimulus legislation. We could see a reconciliation vehicle carrying infrastructure spending and significant international tax proposals. However, um, I think that the Democrats are going to remain hamstrung by COVID and the economy until we see a clear recovery, both in terms of economic indicators and jobs. Um, so the, the timing and the cadence of tax reform, I think, will follow a little bit the timing and the cadence of virus mitigation. Retroactive tax increases are very, very rare. So at this point, we would expect that you would not see corporate income tax increases until 2022. But I will point out if some legislation became fast-tracked um, perhaps we could see a deviation from that. 
Moving to the next slide, I want to talk specifically about what we expect to see on the international front, because I think this is this is really the heart of um, what's going to direct the, the, the way of travel for, for international reform in the U.S. Obviously not pictured on this slide is the corporate rate increase overall in the United States. Currently, our rate sits at 21 percent. Uh, President Biden and several lawmakers on the Democratic side have indicated a rate of either 28 or 25 percent. Uh, just for sake of reference, the, the typical revenue associated with a 1 percent corporate increase in the United States is about $100 billion. Um, so you factor a $3 trillion bill versus a seven point rate increase, you can see that it's not enough. Um, we expect we're also going to see changes in the guilty regime uh, um, as a matter of course during this. We expect that guilty is going to move to more potentially a true global minimum tax, getting rid of some of the protected um, tangible income returns that are built into the guilty system and so forth. So there's two other proposals on here, the 15% minimum tax on book income and the credit and surtax for onshoring, which were both proposals that were part of Biden's legislative uh, campaign, or uh, sorry, uh, presidential campaign, and certainly something that we don't have a lot of information on. So Peter, coming back to you, the moral of the story is very fluid situation in the United States. We expect to see activity in the next several months, and uh, we'll, keep, we'll keep people posted uh, as things develop. Super. Thanks, David. There really is a lot going on. I feel like we've been saying that for a little while now. <laughs> um, we're going to move straight to the panel discussion. Um, and great to see some questions coming in already. And to remind everybody, we're over 250 participants now. So to remind people that there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So please do pose any questions um, to the panelists. As I said at the start, we'll try and deal with as many of them as we can. Okay, we might start off with COVID. Um, COVID clearly has had a huge impact on many aspects of our lives. And for, for many of us, the way we work has been impacted as well. We know some people are working from home exclusively. Others might have been working in a different country completely to their employer. And all of you touched on that in your presentations and the impact that that might have from a tax perspective and the impact that, that you're seeing it have on your clients. Sasha, I might start with, with you. What do you see as the biggest issues presented by the new way people, people are working now? I think firstly, timing, Peter, you know, I, I went through some of the, the views from the Irish revenue and, you know, um, initially in 2020, we thought there was going to be a lot of concessions. It's now seeming that that view is changing um, and, and it's, it's not aligned with what the OECD published in January. Um, what we're having conversations with clients around is, you know, documentation, currently is so important. So you need to document the reason why individuals may not be in their home country or in the country in which they're contracted, um, the COVID reason for that, the business reason for that, and the impact that might have. But I think clients need to con constantly monitor the situation. Um, I think that's really, really important and, and need to have a plan around it. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And David, in the US, what sort of impact are you seeing on clients? Yeah, so um, great point about the mobility issues and the workforce issues. There's a ton of, of um, uncertainty around the way that workforce has kind of changed. I mean, COVID first and foremost impacted people, right? And the way people work and where people work and, and how they perform their duties. And certainly companies need to be aware of a lot of those issues. And I agree with Sasha. I also think supply chain challenges, right? Have become really more prevalent. And we've seen a lot of companies change supply points, change distribution points. And they've done so out of a necessity to survive but there's tax ramifications that come with that. There's transfer pricing things to think about. There's, is my supply chain, um, is my tax supply chain still fit for purpose given my post-COVID environment? And, you know, finally, the, the thing that's really come to the fore, and I think this is true for all of us, as we sit here on a Zoom with 250 people, COVID has pushed technology to the fore, right? And a lot of organizations are looking at their tax function now and saying, are we using automation? Are we leveraging the data that we own? Do we have the right technology capabilities embedded in tax so we can do more with less? And that's been um, you know, something that I think has really forced people's hands uh, in this COVID environment to find better technology, to find better solutions. So um, I see a lot of clients investing on, in that front, Peter. Yeah, I think that, that's a really good point, David. And you're right to bring in transfer pricing. It's not just about personal tax and payroll tax issues and permanent establishments, transfer pricing as well, because people are doing things differently. Supply chains have changed. And Matt, I think you're seeing that in the UK with your clients. That's one of the big things is transfer pricing, isn't it? 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and wholeheartedly agree with that. You know, I think it's we've probably most of us been stuck at home for more than a year now and, and perhaps initially thought this might be a period of weeks or months. And th there is both the, the, the looking back to, to what's been, isn't there, as well as the what does this mean for the future of how business works? And David touched on, on much of that. It's going to mean a more mobile workforce. It's going to mean different kinds of supply chains, different technological requirements, different needs. And, and when business changes, tax profile changes as well. Uh, and and we have to be at the forefront of that, understanding it now and getting it right, rather than after it's happened and, and when we're mopping up the difficulties. So I think absolutely right right now, a big focus for many of my clients is this remote workers problem. You know, how flexible do I want to be as to allowing my people to pick up their laptops and work from anywhere? And what tax risks does that bring? But I think I absolutely agree. It's bigger than that. Um, businesses are changing and the way that, that we expect commerce to work is changing and, and tax has to stay in front of that. Yeah, I completely agree. And, you know, some of the OECD language around people working from home, it's quite friendly. In many cases, it says, look, you shouldn't actually have a, an nexus or a permanent establishment if you're working from home, subject to certain factors. But, you know, if this becomes the new norm, Matt, and people are more and more working from home, you can imagine countries getting a little bit more anxious maybe to grab that revenue. You've got a whole fleet of people working in a particular country. They might say, oh, hold on, that must be an excess, and, and maybe I want some of the tax revenues that you're generating. Do you see that becoming more of a feature going forward? Yeah, absolutely. And we already see challenge somewhat in that area, even from home working around the world, don't we, based on, on where we've got to now. And it's very much akin to the, the current debate, isn't it, around the future of tax, of digital taxes, of the pillar yeah. one discussion around where value is generated and that the more and more we live in a, in a world where the workforce is fully mobile and value is being generated from different places around the world. I think the more aggressive we're going to see tax authorities, including HMRC, be about when that value is demonstrably in the UK. Yeah, I think that's right. And we will talk a little bit more about pillar one um, and digital tax and all things that go with that. Sasha, just coming back to the transfer pricing points that, that Matt and David mentioned, obviously Ireland has had some significant changes in transfer pricing unique to Ireland within the last 12 months and not without some controversy. Controversy. How do you see that settling down in Ireland? Yeah, we're, we're working a lot with clients um, in the space, Peter, at the moment and having discussions, one, to make sure their documentation is fit for purpose. Um, and the second point then, I suppose we did have the the carve out for non-trading loan transactions historically and that worked very well for multinational groups and um, funding interest free from Ireland that no longer works from the 1st of January 2020 so there's a lot of discussion in that area around funding structures fit for purpose and obviously layered on top of that is interest deductibility anti-hybrids so it's all coming on train for, for Irish multinationals in a very very short space of time um, I think which is which is really really important um, and just a point I think on the transfer pricing piece um, around COVID and which has been made so the challenge for businesses currently is that you know the comparable benchmarking analysis is currently um is not available because we're still evolving with covid so while businesses are changing and and, and adapting currently which they have to do with their models i think real-time data and how they capture that is really really important to support the changes that they're making yeah yeah i think that's a really sure. good point if if I could maybe just to tack on one transfer pricing thing that that uh, yeah, I've seen in 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 the market um, quite a bit is you know I think taxpayers see this also as an opportunity to go after some certainty and tax authorities are increasing their abilities around things like APAs map agreements um, horizontal monitoring in the Netherlands and some other European countries where it's an opportunity to to engage with negotiations in negotiations with tax authorities and arrive at a conclusion and get some certainty. Right. So I think that's something that that we're seeing accelerate in the transfer pricing area. And I would encourage panelists to think again about is documentation and crossing my fingers the best way to defend my transfer pricing? Or is it really worth paying for some certainty up front um, going through a more formal process, which tax authorities are getting more and more experienced with? So I just wanted to leave that on the table. Yeah. And I suppose, Dave, the only piece around that is APAs are normally for a three to five year period. We may have businesses who have negotiated those historically and currently now they're not fit for purpose. So That's they need correct. to look at that and, and decide, take a position. Are they going to go back to those tax authorities now or are they going to breach those agreements? And I think that that's another um, factor. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think you're going to see a lot more engagement. We probably should be seeing a lot more engagement with uh, tax authorities because I suspect a lot of APAs aren't fit for purpose um, anymore due to changes. Um, when people think about transfer pricing, really transfer pricing is about profit allocation. 
and pillar one is really about wh where are my profits allocated. Um, David, turning to you in terms of pillar one, it was interesting that under your previous previous administration, pretty much stepped away from the negotiations um, under President Trump. You're now back at the table. I mean, pillar one and the, the whole aim to you know allocate profits for digital companies really to market jurisdictions is going to mean more tax for a lot of big tech companies. A lot of those big tech companies are US companies. So why under the Biden administration are the US back at the table now? Or is there something else going on there? Yeah, I mean, certainly, I think um, Janet Yellen's comments recently at the G20 and uh, elsewhere were, were, were very, very positive um, for, the, for the negotiations. I will say that um, I believe Pillar 1 um, is, is still very challenged in terms of a defined scope and some other things that need significant political agreement. In July 2021, as Sasha mentioned, is the target date, right, that the OECD kind of has out there. We're going to make our suggestions. Um, why the Biden administration might come back to the table is, look, we recognize, I think, in the United States that, that there are still, you know, pockets of, of low tax income. Our guilty system um, is coming online. We're starting to see how that works. And certainly nobody wants unilateral DSTs or, you know, trade disagreements um, to hamper economic growth coming out of COVID-19. Whether or not the, the most recent activities and, and comments by the US government sig signal a, an agreement or a, a pending agreement to pillar one, I think is a very different question than why we might've come back to the table um, to engage in negotiation. So only time will tell um, where this all head. I for one am not on the optimistic side that a broad pillar one uh, is in the offing. I certainly think there's a lot of common ground on pillar two. Um, but as you've mentioned to me before, Pillar 2 is not the revenue raiser necessarily here. So, um, you know, I, 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 I think we're at a pivotal time and I think things will, um, time will tell um, and we will, we will see where yeah. Pillar 1 goes. Yeah, no, I, I do think, I think Pillar 1 has the potential to be the big revenue raiser, but very difficult to get consensus on it, which is why we're seeing a lot of countries do their own thing ahead of time. And Matt, one of those countries is the UK in terms of digital services tax how has that gone down in the UK and how relevant is it for, for clients? How costly is it? It's an interesting question, Peter, because we're talking about revenue raises here, especially in light of coronavirus and kind of balancing the books, right? And, and digital services tax in the UK is, is not a big revenue raiser. When you look at HMRC's expectations as to how much revenue it raises, it's relatively minimal. So I think on, on balance, I think there are something like 40 to 50 companies globally that will be within the scope of the UK's DST. And the amount that it raises is immaterial in terms of the tax that the UK collects elsewhere. So DST in the UK, in, in my personal view, was much more a political statement than it was a revenue raiser um, to, to be seen to be doing something to tackle the digital tax debate. Um, but the, the UK clearly at the table for a, a global solution on this, but I uh, think ha had to be seen to act more quickly than the OECD consensus was getting to. Yeah, and I think that's the a similar scenario, Matt, in other countries. It's politically driven. I think initially probably it wasn't even envisaged to be in for that long, but now it's almost, how do you, how do you remove it? Because that's equally polit as politically challenging. Um, Sasha, th those taxes, any sort, any sort of digital taxes, be it under the OECD or even existing taxes that we see in other countries bring in unilaterally, that has must have an impact in Ireland because we have so many tech companies in Ireland. It presumably means that potentially a portion of our tax revenues will disappear. So could it be said that we'll still be attractive, but maybe not quite as attractive as we were? Yeah, well, it's interesting you pose the question today, because I suppose in the last two weeks, we've had three major job announcements for, from three major headquartered um, US firms, Workday, um, Intel and Stripe. And Intel just announced earlier this week that they've put seven billion into Ireland in investment terms in the last few years. So I think we have large FDI businesses here. They're here for various different reasons, but there is a huge infrastructural um, investment in Ireland. We've always had a substance test in Ireland. And I think that's really beneficial for given where global tax reform has gone. I think it's important that the, you know, the labor market and the talent continues to follow so that we can, we can help fill those FDI roles as they, as they continue. Um, I think the other thing we've been probably 
the government has done a good job in relation to our roadmap. So they first launched a roadmap on corporate tax in 2018. We've just updated it again in January. And I suppose how it works is it's giving clear visibility to multinational organisations where Ireland is going in the future. Um, a lot of our changes where we have consultation around them. So there's not surprises that are that are landing on the table. For example, um, going forward, there's two key areas that have been highlighted is that Ireland is going to look at its outbound payments and withholding tax regime, and there's going to be an annual stakeholder engagement um, with government. So I think that's welcomed. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think it, it certainly is. Sasha, you are the only EU representative on this call. So I'm going to ask you about, sorry, Matt, I'm going to ask you about the EU digital levy plans. And, you know, we've seen the EU come out with a few initiatives over the last year or so. How do they sit with the OECD plans under Pillar 1? Yeah, well, interestingly, again, um, I think we're quite timely with the conference this week. Um, you know, the, the position from the EU was they were going to sit and wait and see what was happening at an, o, an OECD level. Um, and they've just come out last week and said they're not and they're going to move forward. And there's going to be some plans published in June. So you have the OECD saying July, you've now the EU saying June. How are they going to marry um, you know, the commentary from the 27 EU finance ministers has been that they, they really want the EU to wait. Um, you know, a global solution, as we know, is going to be a much better solution rather than, you know, an EU only solution and obviously how that marries internationally. Um, but there is a real push for visibility on this from the EU. They have amended yeah. the legislation this week and launched Act 7, which will mean that um, the operators of online platforms will have to disclose income generated by sellers on those platforms from the 1st of January 2023. So there's a clear message from the EU that they're not going to wait around any longer in relation to this. Yeah, and I think and David called it out earlier, it's certainty really that's what taxpayers want. We know the rules are going to change so that the longer the uncertainty remains that that's not good. Um, the other big part of, of BEPS 2.0, if you like, is, is Pillar 2. Um, Pillar 2, for those who don't know, is all about a global minimum uh, effective tax rate. In short, groups would need to pay a, a minimum level of tax on the profits. We don't know yet what that rate might be. David, you guys already have your, your guilty rules, which do sort of sum of what the global minimum rate uh, is, is trying to do. What's your take on, on Pillar 2 and how might it work with what your existing guilty is or what your guilty might become? Peter, it's a, it's a great question, and I'll tell you a funny story. Um, I was reading about Yellen's comments, and several of her comments came in conversations with other ministers and then were reported after the fact. And one of the quotes that was, was reported was that she, in addition to agreeing to kind of stand down with our safe harbor demand on Pillar 1, she also agreed that we would consider taking steps to align our guilty system to match the, the Pillar 2 proposals, right? Our guilty system has some, some major, I think, um, differences than maybe what's being proposed by the OECD. One of them is that we give a return on tangible income. The interesting part is there are several lawmakers in the United States that have very publicly criticized the decision to give a return on tangible income um, that's not subject to guilty. So, so without taking too much time, the way that works is if you invest in significant tangible property in a foreign country, you're allowed a 10% return on that tangible property that escapes the guilty system, if you will, because the guilty system is intended just to get intangible property. Well, that encourages people to invest in tangible property and create jobs offshore, which politicians say doesn't make sense. So I could see that tangible property piece of guilty going away. The big question is whether guilty will become a country by country type tax where you have to look at each income stream and tax by country, or whether we'll continue to allow a blending. I think those are two areas where we could see the United States come to the table and say, hey, look, as part of our next legislative package, these proposals could be made to amend the guilty tax. It brings it closer in line with Pillar 2. And I think, um, you know, then the big question becomes, um, how do other countries effectively implement a pillar two? Because pillar two works a whole lot better when all the major countries have a pillar two, right? Because it stops people from entering a jurisdiction where they could avoid a global minimum tax. So um, I, I think there, I personally feel like there's a lot of traction for, for that type of outcome. I'm, I'm again, more bullish on pillar two than I am on pillar one. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think it is going to be easier to get something agreed than pillar two that, that, than pillar one, all right. I'm not sure... Not sure it's going to be a big revenue raiser. And, and Matt, you called out how the digital services tax hasn't raised much revenue in, in the UK. Neither has your CFC regime. It doesn't raise much revenue. We don't know what the effective minimum rate might be, that the minimum rate under Pillar 2. But what's your take on, on what Pillar 2 might mean, whether we will get consensus or what's the view in the UK on it? 
Yes, yeah, so I, I think absolutely Philippe is more likely to have a consensus for you. And I think the UK would, would back both of these proposals at the moment as they stand to, to get something done. I think there are still many views that, that see these as a package, that you know one comes with two and, and one can't exist without the other. So it'll be interesting to see over the coming months if there is more alignment on the on the two proposals, whether that horse can bolt by itself. Um, I think what, what Pillar 2 represents is potentially very interesting though, isn't it? Which is kind of the end of the race to the bottom for corporate taxes. So not only tackling the tax havens and the use of little to no tax jurisdictions, but also tackling how low can a corporate tax rate go for an investment jurisdiction. And um, obviously I ask you guys about what you think about the Irish rate and if there's potential for that increase. But you can see now in, in US politics, there's, there's backing for a rate increase and the UK has just announced its rate increase. So the UK might have been one of the first announcers, but I think we can we can sense the steam in the pot that, that rate increases are, are going to be a more common occurrence throughout this year and next year. F firstly, to kind of fill the gap that the coronavirus has presented. And second, viewed through that pillar two viewpoint, which is, you know, a, a very low tax rate is, is not the ideal outcome anymore. It's a sustainable rate with a decent tax base to, to generate tax revenues as required. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. And we did go through through a period of years, notwithstanding what you said, where corporate tax rates were coming down globally. And now that has reversed and it may have happened anyway, but certainly COVID has spurred on countries to, to the need to raise revenues. Interestingly, I do remember our, our global head of tax, Francesca Largerberg, on radio in Ireland, just throwing out the possibility of reducing corporate taxes to zero everywhere. And a lot of economists would favor that. I'm not saying that's going to ever happen. I think that would be politically palatable, but there, it, it has got its merits. I think You're, it's interesting. Sorry, I, I know you want to go to one more question. I just want to make this comment. I mean, you, we talk about revenue raisers and taxes as revenue raisers, and there's an absolute need to, to raise revenue. Some of the best taxes, though, some of the best tax provisions, it's not about the revenue they raise, it's about the behavior they drive, right? And, and we see several provisions in the United States that are so punitive that people avoid them, which drives the behavior into the other system that allows us to close that tax gap. So I don't want to get completely lost in revenue raising. I want to make sure that, you know, that people are also focused on how the behavior changes when, when things like this come online, because that's really important. And David, just in relation to that, there is a view that, you know, are we moving too forward too fast in relation to pillar one and pillar two? And has there been enough time given to some of the, you know, the changes that have been brought around from a global tax reform position? Because we're really not going to see the impact of that and how it's impacting behaviors probably for another year or two. Um, mm -hmm. so, so there is a consensus around that, that, you know, are these the OECD and the EU moving forward too quickly? I think, that, I think that's a great point, Sasha. I think there's been very little. Pillar 2 wasn't even in the original BEPS proposals at all. And there's been no time to see have those mindset changes that, David, you described, have they actually taken place already? Because I think they probably have. But notwithstanding that, we're moving into straight away into BEPS 2.0. Um, Matt, you're no longer in the EU. So you're free from the EU shackles, which would suggest that you have an opportunity to become that, that tax haven, despite all our, our mindset changes. So given all of that, it was, I think, a surprise to many people that the UK corporate tax rate is going to increase from 19% to 25%. How do you see that in the context of the EU, you know, trying to remain competitive from a tax perspective? Yeah, I think that the UK tends to try and position itself halfway in between an, an attraction of investment jurisdiction and a consumer jurisdiction with a high base, right, where we're smack bang in the middle of those principles. Um, and it, the, the rate increase is a sign that the UK is not looking to become the tax haven of the future. And the, there were some comments from politicians at, in Brexit time that, that our rate should come down further, you know, to 17 or 15 and, and become the, the Singapore of, of Western Europe, um, which hasn't been the case. But I think what, what, what likely is going to be the case is that the UK is free of EU bounds in, in tax law that it doesn't necessarily see eye to eye with and, and wouldn't have pursued on its own. So I think the repeal of the Interest and Royalties Directive was one of those items. I think the repeal of DAC 6 before it even made it into law is another example there. So I don't think it's that we're going to see the UK become a tax haven for investment, but I think we will start to see divergence on policy as, as the UK government sees fit. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that, that's a good point. And actually, just you mentioned the, the repeal of the Interest and Royalty Directives, one of the questions from one of our guests was the impact, practical implications of that. Is it fair to say, Matt, that really under treaties, for the most part, you get down to a 0% withholding anyway? 
Maybe, yeah. So the UK has the biggest treaty network in the world, um, and many of our bilateral treaties with our European friends allow for zero percent withholding rates anyway. Um, so you may find that a zero percent withholding under the directive is is merely replaced with a zero percent rate under a double tax treaty. But there are some exceptions, um, and, and notably, you know, a dividend out of Germany, the best you're going to get is a five percent withholding tax now. Um, and given the UK has a broad dividend exemption not a credit system, that's a real cash tax cost, right? So a UK holding company with a German operating subsidiary is going to lose 5% of that distribution to a cash tax cost. And, and there are some other examples of, of where our treaties don't have zero. So would absolutely encourage everybody to take a look at their cross-border payments, EU to UK and UK to EU, to assess whether they're relying on treaties or directives. And if any of those payments are relying on the directive to get to nil, then you need to do a treaty analysis and work out what to do next. Yeah, that's a really good point. Sasha, the UK is our nearest neighbour. The tax rate will be double our rate from 2023. Does that open up opportunities for Ireland? Yeah, look, I think, you know, we've been having conversations with um, with companies on the Brexit piece for the last 36 months. And we would have thought, you know, at the end of December, it probably, you know, th those conversations would have ended. We're still having conversations and we're working with Matt and a lot of his colleagues, you know, with existing UK operations who want to have a set up in Ireland. I suppose we are the only English speaking country now in the EU. Um, but also from, from an EU perspective, there's operational reasons, there's regulatory reasons. I was just on a call this afternoon with, with one of our other UK colleagues um, with a, a business looking to relocate here for regulatory reasons, but also access to EU funding is another key concern um, for businesses, um, you know, that have their main operations in the UK. Um, so I think, um, you know, I don't think it's a them or us situation. I think on, on all on all the, the businesses we, we, we've been talking to, it's very much a joined up approach and, um, and how those businesses need to structure themselves between the UK and Ireland going forward. Yeah, yeah, I think that's spot on. Uh, and David, just from the US's perspective, um, there's talk of the US corporate tax rate going up. You obviously had a lot of reform, fundamental reform in 2017 under Trump. He had both houses at the time. You now have an administration where you do just about have both houses. So, you know, will is Biden likely to have a lot of difficulty actually getting reform? It's 50-50, isn't it, in the in the House? So what's the what is the likelihood of fun, more fundamental reform in the US? And where in the context of that, con, where do you see corporate tax rates going in the US? Yeah, so um, timing, I, I think, is more the question. I think there's pretty broad consensus that if something's going to get done legislatively during Biden's first term, it's going to be paid for with international and corporate, right? So the, the corporate rate that I mentioned, the changes to guilty, uh, some of the other tightening of the international provisions, uh, some of the things that, quite frankly, were, were granted in the, in the Trump uh, legislation, the TCGA, um, I, I expect that that's going to be the place. The question is really when and and, and what's going to be the vehicle. And when I, what I mean by vehicle is what legislative process are we going to use? Are we going to tie it to something like infrastructure, which I think a lot of people are concerned about? Um, are we going to try to do it more on a standalone basis um, just to get the, the changes through? Um, I, I think COVID will dictate the answers to some of those questions. Like I mentioned, the timing of the virus and, and how the recovery goes. And if the vaccinations continue to be strong and the economy does, does pick up and inflation stays in check, I think you could see some ratcheting of some tax revenue. But if, if COVID takes a turn uh, or the economy takes a turn, you know, we very well could still be a ways off from seeing that. But I, I think it's a matter of when, it, it, not if, Peter, to be honest with you. Yeah. You know, that, that, that makes sense. I think that's the general expectation. And um, some really good questions coming in through the Q&A function. So please, folks, do continue to, to post them as we try and get to as many of them as we can. One of them relates to MAP and APA. And I think coming back to the point around, look, lots of governments and exchequers are under pressure. There is going to be a drive to try and raise more revenues. You'll have, I think there's an expectation companies are going to be paying more taxes. So I think there's maybe uh, an incentive for countries to try and grab that extra revenue to pay for things. Do you see, um, Sasha, let's start with you. Do you see an environment of a lot more disputes between companies, countries in this grab for revenues over the next few years, given all the changes we've already seen? Now there's more changes down the road. It's going to take a while for, for everybody to, to sort of understand you know, things to settle down and understand what the lie of the land is. And while we're waiting for that, there'll be more disputes. 
Yeah, I think so. And, you know, for, for taxpayers, that ends up in the MAP procedure. You know, you're kind of in the middle of two tax authorities on either side of the table trying to, you know, reach, reach a central negotiation point. Um, you know, it's obviously very important. There's certain timelines around to make sure you get into MAP and in the relevant different jurisdictions. And that's really important to, to keep an eye on that. Um, but also, it's a huge cost to the business. You know, from, from the existing conversations we've had with clients that are in, in MAP procedures, it's a huge cost to the business to engage in these discussions. They take a long period of time. What position does the business take? Does it provide for that liability now or within its financial statements? Or does it wait until the end of negotiations and, and then deal with it? So there's transparency to shareholders, etc. So it does create a lot of um, talking points and a, and a lot of positions that businesses need to consider. Yeah, yeah. Matt, from your perspective, do you envisage yourself being very busy on your colleagues dealing with disputes over the next 10 years? I think so, from a transfer pricing perspective, and also I'm already very busy on, on residence-based maps, given the, the multilateral instrument change, which means many of the UK's treaty tiebreakers for residents have changed from effective management to competent authority procedures. Um, so I'm involved in a number of competent authority procedures alongside HMRC and another tax authority merely to resolve instances of, of dual residence um, and they can be lengthy, um, time consuming, lots of effort, um, whereas previously you, you would have resolved that via self-assessment and effective management. So there's definitely more maps going on, um, but I think also we are seeing commitment from HMRC and other tax authorities to try and make sure that dispute resolution mechanisms are there and they are able to be used and they're able to be smooth and efficient. HMRC yeah. is committing to speedier, more efficient dispute resolution where it can and more resource in this area. And of course, in some cases, the best way to avoid a dispute is to have a, an APA in place. And, and David, in the US, or do you see that as being a feature, more APAs, less uncertainty? Yeah, absolutely. Right. We've doubled down on um, APAs and our ability to conclude. And certainly um, certain jurisdictions lend themselves to APAs a, a lot more. But as we see tax authorities um, bring online some of the some of the changes that, quite frankly, were brought around with BEPS 1.0, we see an increased ability in more jurisdictions to negotiate these. We see inventories coming down, meaning negotiations are concluding. The trouble right now with APAs is COVID. And what do you do? Like Sasha mentioned, you've got your old APA. Do you need a new APA? Can you deviate from your old APA? And the IRS has actually been very vocal. Like, don't just change your pricing and write COVID at the top of the form. We really need to understand how COVID impacted your business and why the APA shouldn't still apply. So um, I think that taxpayers want certainty. I think as the cost of APA come more in line, taxpayers with significant cross-border risk are well served, whether it's unilateral or bilateral, to try to gain some certainty up front. I think it's a it's a great process. And look, I mean, the way we the way we kind of talk about it is you know, documenting something for three or four years versus getting an APA that covers you for three or four years where you can just document your compliance, the cost is not that much different. In one, you're kind of gambling, you know, you're, you have to beg for forgiveness. In the other one, you've got everything cleared up front, which is a huge business uh, imperative for a lot of companies. So yeah, I think the APA is um, a big tool in the future. So there's a really good question in respect of just, just pointing out how fast things have moved in the last few years. And it has, it's moved ridiculously quickly since the start of BEPS in maybe 13 or 14. Um, lots has changed and lots of it was politically driven. When you go back to the start, you had the Apple case, you had the Starbucks case, et cetera, appeals or tribunals in both the US and the UK. Do you think there's any chance that you know things will just stall again? The public will lose interest and the momentum that's built for change will stall and we'll over time go back to the old ways or is this the new norm and it's going to keep moving? Sasha, what do you think? No, I don't think, you know, the train is out of the station and I think this is going one direction. And, and you know, it's interesting because I think that, that, that COVID and, and the new way of working is probably even going to drive further change. Um, you know, if people want to work in different locations for different businesses, um, it's going to create issues. And I think tax law is going to have to change to accommodate that. Um, so I think we're, we're looking for further changes down the track. People want transparency. Um, and and that, that's clear. Um, um, but businesses want certainty. So that has to be balanced. Matt, you think it's yeah. going to keep going? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, we, we are on that train, aren't we? So that the more the world changes, the more tax law needs to change to keep up. And I think what, what we're seeing is that tax authorities are trying to make changes quicker um, than they've ever done before to keep up with, with how fast the world is changing. And I think for the 
the decade I've been in tax, um, we've seen the UK tax rules change considerably and, and the BEPS provisions coming into UK tax law like the anti-hybrid rules, like the corporate interest restriction, similar to the US 163J rule, has, has completely changed the corporate tax climate. Um, and I think that there's more of that to come. Yeah. David, anything you want to add to that? I suspect you'll agree with Sasha and Matt. Well, we've been lucky in the U.S. to keep things very simple, as always. So not much uh, to, to worry about here. I, look, I, I agree with all that. I think it's going to change. I think the big, the other thing that people fail to realize is the impact of technology on, on tax, right? And, and um, tax authorities' ability to gain insight into data. Um, I think, you know, a lot of the jurisdictions that we're seeing have um, um, real success have turned to a data, you know, driven approach where they're using technology to, to target their audits, to target their enforcement and to educate. So I would not underestimate the role that technology is going to play in tax in the next decade and beyond. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I might just touch briefly on the MLI, which I know the US hasn't brought in, but uh, Sasha and Matt, the MLI has been in place now for a little while, depending on what country you may have signed up with. In practice, how relevant is it for companies? Sasha, do you want to take that one first? Yeah, we've obviously, you know, seen it. Ireland has implemented it, had it since 2019, and, and obviously it's, it's over layering on our, our double tax treaties. And some countries have adopted into some articles and not into others, like we haven't opted into the, the, the PE one and we'll have reserved our position in relation to that. But what we're seeing, I think, will be that the principal purpose test being a, a real driver of change um, in, in this regard. And we've already seen it um, with some of our European colleagues in, in, their, in their territories, how it's having an impact and how some of them even domestically are taking a view around the principal purpose test and putting parameters around them, which is meaning that it's having impact um, from an international tax planning perspective perspective um so yeah we're already seeing it peter and i think it's only going to continue yeah something that was really interesting about mli was that it was a way to get something done wasn't it across the world without having to amend each and every bilateral tax treaty of which there are hundreds of thousands um so i think it was a great example of how we can get something done when we want to at, at oecd level and it might be an indicator of how we might tackle some of the pillar one and two questions that would require a lot of domestic in interpretation into law i think in terms of where i see the most change as a result of signing up to the mli i think we touched on the residence tiebreaker that's made a big difference to us in the uk the other one as sasha says is the ppt and more and more pressure on on holding companies holding company locations and their substance as to why that that business is in that place and you know it's no longer acceptable to have holding companies where you choose to pop them because of of treaty benefits um and so companies that have nobody in them and a few boilerplate stickers on them are not going to work in the future and so there is more and more debate and challenge for businesses as to around where do i hold my investments and and why do i do it that way yeah yeah, I think that that's such a mindset change now compared to you can't imagine even thinking that 10 years ago, it seems, it seems alien. Um, Matt, just sticking with you, just, there have been a couple of questions just, and we've covered it already, but I might just recap on it again, and just the impact of remote working, personal tax, and PE. Do you want to just sort of clarify, say from the UK perspective, it's probably got application for lots of countries, as to what yeah. it means? Yeah, absolutely. And so I guess this is, as we said, uh, looking backwards at and forwards, where we're very busy at the moment assisting businesses with understanding that their remote work population, where people are, if they're working outside of the jurisdiction of employment and the implications that that brings. So there's a few lenses to look at that through from a, a payroll income tax withholding perspective and, and social security, as well as whether that individual could cause a permanent establishment in the location that they're working in. And, and those are independent tests, but, but very much linked. And the considerations will be around where have they gone? How long are they working from that place? What are they doing while they're there? Um, and what kind of place are they working from if there is an office or equipment provided? Um, and we're finding many businesses that didn't have a good policy around this that are now stepping where they are here in March 2021, looking back over the last 12 months and, and have a mess. You know, and are looking at hundreds of people that have worked from many, many places and understanding even just the risk profile of those employees to date. So I think as well as dealing with the past, one of my most encouraging messages is do, do whatever you think you want to do as a business, but do it purposefully. You know, one of the worst things you can do is not have a policy and just be mopping up these risks. 
if you want to be ultra flexible about your where your people work from that's great but be ready for that you know have have an FAQs document, have a policy, have procedures in place to track who those people are, where they're going and what they're doing for how long so that you can get ahead of these risks because they are there. And, and I think, Matt, the thing is, if that's some of that stuff, and obviously looking back, we can't, but if some of that stuff can be looked at in advance, there's, you know, there's a real opportunity to be able to structure to kind of avoid shadow payroll, avoid additional social security taxes. Um, and and that's, that's really important for, for businesses to bear in mind. Completely yeah. agree. Yeah, and I think that's probably a really good place to, to unfortunately end our, our, our webinar in terms of companies just having a look at what they're doing and assessing is everything still fit for purpose given all the changes. Um, we could go on longer, but uh, unfortunately time doesn't permit. So thank you very much, Sasha, David and Matt for those great insights and to everybody for participating and for your questions and for, and for attending today. Um, we are going to follow up with everybody who registered early next week with the brief synopsis of the key issues that we discussed, plus a recording of the session if any of you missed any part of it. Hopefully you did find today's webinar informative and we look forward to seeing you virtually anyway, uh, again at our next one. Um, so once again, many thanks to our panelists and many thanks to all of you for attending and have a great day. Thank you.